Hello and welcome to From the Rooker End, a special podcast, an extra podcast for you. Uh, and this is all about a brand new book that's come out called Bonza Out. Uh, it's all about following Watford Football Club to the 1970s. Now, it's from our friends, our very good friends at the Watford Treasury. Uh, you've been hopefully reading their magazine that they've been doing for quite a while now uh, and the last couple of uh, last year I suppose they've uh, released two books one in the 1950s and 60s was what I interviewed both Colin and Jeff a while ago about that one um, but they what they always do with the treasury is their beautiful books and the photographs they have the historical visual history that they put into all their publications are just fantastic. And this one looks at 19, like I say, the 1970s. Now, I was only alive for the last three months of the 1970s. So it's uh, an era that I don't really know a lot about. Maybe the last couple of years, because, hey, that's when Graham Taylor turned up. And if you've listened to Enjoy the Game, the podcast, the audio book of Lionel's book, you know, you we know a lot about that, the end of it. But I suppose for me, as a, as a Watford fan, as I've got older, I've really enjoyed finding out more about the history. And, and we speak to Ollie Wicken, who was part of the team of Watford Treasury team, and he, he partly wrote this book. You know, the work that Ollie does with Hornet Heaven as a podcast, a fantastical um, stories he has about all these dead Watford fans and ex-players and ex-managers that are up in heaven watching Watford day in, day out. You know, learning a little bit about the history is something that I've really, really enjoyed. Um, but these particular, these little books, are they half A4? But they're like, like, they're like rectangular um in a, in shape you get them from the haunt shop but um the you know these books are, are an amazing look like peering back into history i suppose is what's what's fantastic about them so we do highly recommend you get a copy from the hornet shop or from their website the watford treasury.co.uk but this is an interview i did with a, a few of the gang uh, to really sort of get their feeling of what it was like to support watford in the 1970s you'll hear from colin payne richard white and you'll hear from the Wiccan brothers. That's Ollie and Jeff, who we've heard in the podcast many, many times. So I had to ask them, of course, me being a, a you know only at the end of the 1970s, when the, the decade started as Watford fans, how old were they and how long have they been supporting Watford? <laughs> Colin, when did you start going? First started going to Watford. I went to a game, I think it was 74, 75. Must admit, we I went with a friend from school. His dad took us, and it was because Bobby Charlton was playing for Preston. I'd love to say it was love at first sight. Wasn't at all interested. Come away, and it was to be another three or four years before I returned. I returned in round about Christmas 1977 for a cup game against Colchester. Totally opposite effect, I was hooked. From that moment on, it almost instantly I was drawn in. It was almost a magical thing where just that, I don't know what happened in between that first game and the second game, but I just wanted to keep going. Uh, Richard, what about you? Yeah, on the first um, of that year, I was um, just uh, 14. So I was quite seriously into my Watford supporting career. Um, I started supporting them about 18 months earlier when I was old enough to get to the games on my own because uh, my dad wasn't really interested in football. He worked on a Saturday anyway. But the only way I got into it was through people at school who used to go to the games and talk about it on a Monday morning. I used to get really fed up because I really wanted to go. I'd, I'd actually started supporting Watford the season before the 68-69 uh, season when we um, won the league. So in terms of you know how we started off and what our influences were, it couldn't have been better for me. You thought, this is the way it's always going to be. And that was followed up by a good run to the semi-finals, of course, um, the next uh, season. And um, things were quite good. So I was let down, really, over the next few years. And uh, <laughs> there's more stories about that. But to be honest, from the first moment I walked into that ground in 1968, I was hooked. I just loved it. I love the yellow shirts. I love the sand in the middle of the pitch. I love the green edges. It was all, just, and the crowd reaction. It was just where I wanted to be for the rest of my life. And I have been. So <laughs> that, was, that was my experience anyway. So whatever happened, I wasn't going to give it up. Jeff? Uh, well, my first game was um, September 1968. I was eight at the time. I was nine when the 70s actually started. Um, and I think what happened was that 
Ollie and I had started showing some interest in football that year, really. And I do remember watching the Man United Benfica European Cup final on TV. And our dad decided that if we were going to get interested in football, it was probably best if we supported the local team. He had had no background as a football supporter at all, but Watford was the local team and all four of us went, my dad, my mum, myself, Ollie, and it was his idea of a family thing. And it remained that way for for quite some time. Uh, The first match was a nil-nil draw. And they did get promoted in that first season, as as Richard said, Mm. the 68-9 season was, in retrospect, a pretty good time to have started supporting them. So, Ollie, you've been exactly the same in terms of first game and... Uh, Exactly the same first game. I was a little bit younger, so I was five for my first game. So I was just seven when the 1970s started. You know, like Richard said, joined at a great time. I was probably one of those spoilt brats who didn't know how good I had it. And the the John Moonies of those days were sort of grumbling about how, uh, oh, it was all much better in the 1920s before we got into the Football League and all of that kind of stuff. Got little flashes of memories of running around on the bend, um, standing on stools. Uh, Our horrible Grandma Florence used to come with us sometimes to the football as well and she got very cross at our messing around but yeah Jeff said it was a family thing and it really was because our parents carried on going long after we weren't standing with them and even after we both both left home they still went to watch Watford together and stood under the scoreboard remarkably (laughs) with all the other Herberts and they'd stand there doing the Times crossword at half time you know, and then matching anoraks. It was, it was uh, extraordinary, really. But that, it was a different era. You wouldn't get stories like that today. So, context-wise, we just won promotion at the beginning of the because I know where the end of the decade is. It's rocketing up um, with under Graham, and you know. But at the beginning of the the decade, Jeff, could you sort of say where Watford were at? I know in terms of they just got promoted, but in in the wider football world. Yes, I mean it, it was it was the highest up the league they'd ever been. This it was a uh, you know, they'd never been in the second division before 1969. And for all these years that they were in the third division south and the third division the the second division had been regarded as and I quote the promised land. <laughs> so they they achieved this in um the spring of 1969. So, yes, it, it was an all-time high. That first season in Division 2, as it was, 1969-70, in the league was a season of right old struggle, really. They didn't score many goals. They didn't actually let in all that many, but they they were in the bottom two. Two teams were relegated at the time for quite a little while, never far away from it. They ended up finishing 19th, I think, out of the 22. But the big thing was they had this cup run. So that's what Mm. kept people excited. Got all the way through to the semi-final. So the semi-final, which they'd beaten Liverpool in the quarter-final, a very famous game, um, the first time they'd really beaten a big side ever, and got to the semi-final, which, you know, they, they got hammered. By Chelsea, I don't know if Richard, being a bit older, had the sense that it wasn't going to get any better because you know you look at it in retrospect, they didn't really have the resources to compete at that level against the bigger clubs in that division at the time. Although you know you look at those names and they wouldn't feel like bigger clubs now. That's right. I mean, I I do remember some of the supporters uh, moaning that we weren't investing in the team that season. I think Ray Lugg was the only person we bought for £8,000. Um, the excuse the board had was that they just uh, paid £50,000 for the main stand extension, the ugly duckling <laughs> extension on the on the main stand. And uh, really, they had no other money to spend. So it was always a struggle that season, as Jeff said. And um, yeah, I was maybe had a slightly older perspective, but well aware that um, the league form wasn't great and that we were struggling to to score goals against sides um Barry Ending wasn't as prolific as he had been the season before um soon to be uh, moved on and uh, not really replaced so uh, but we did struggle on for a couple more years 
um, at that level um, before we finally went down. But it never looked like changing. There was quite a good incident with Barry Endin that I suspect may have led to him being moved on. Um, it was in a cup tie away at Oxford this, the following season, 70 to 71. Um, it was either the third round or the fourth round. Um, Watford were losing 2-1 and it was right near the end of the game and um, Endine was uh, was getting the bird, as it used to be called, from the home crowd at uh, the manor ground in Oxford. And he dropped his shorts uh, and mooned at the crowd. And um, when asked about this afterwards, his uh, justification was, I had to do it. We were going out of the cup. <laughs> he played one more match, I think, after that and then okay. got uh, moved on to Charlton Athletic. Yeah, yeah. Ollie, those, those, those between there, you know, let, let, you know, guide me, guide me through from from that point there, showing his bum to Graham turning up. What was what was life for you in that sort of middle part of of the of the decade? Wow, there's a lot of water under the bridge between Barry's bum and Graham Taylor turning up. <laughs> I can tell you that much. Uh, I would say actually, if um, if any of your listeners haven't seen the FA Cup semi-final. It's an extraordinary watch. Mm. Uh, it's on YouTube and there's very extensive highlights. Um, and uh, if you look at the <laughs> surface on which it was played, it was extraordinary. The tackling was extraordinary. I don't think there were any that were quite neck high, but there were there was a lot of tough tackling going on. Mm. Um, and it's interesting just to look at it with, you know, your 2024 20, eyes to think, you know, how good were Chelsea? How good were Watford? Look at the football and just see how football has changed. But it, And also the, the atmosphere at the ground. And there's something about that I still love about uh, stadium and looking at old uh, footage of it. Just the way the crowd moves in the ground. You don't see crowds move anymore because we're all set in our seats or uh, we're all constrained by by the seats in our rows but the way that the, the crowd moves is like liquid um when there's a, a near miss or a goal it, everybody sort of pulls forward surges forward like uh, like a tide coming in on the beach and then they just sort of circle around a bit and then slowly go back and it's, it's just like water on sand it's i find it mesmerizing to watch um and it was so exciting to be part of as well when that kind of thing was happening um, so uh, I do recommend people have a look at that. What happened after Barry Endine, um, I actually have got the quote from the Watford Observer to add to Jeff's anecdote, which was that he also said, I was near to tears, which was why he pulled his shorts down. Um, and he was uh, he was shipped off to Charlton. Um, and Oliver Phillips wrote an article about him and said, Barry Endine said, the rookery end has been great to me. So has the rest of the ground apart from the main stand side, says M. Dean, <laughs> whose views on this section of fans is unprintable. Uh, <laughs> right. says. So he, he was a character. Um, so what happened after that? Um, it was, was life, was it up and down? Was it a, a, a dip, but then steady or? So after the cup final, after the heights of the cup final, uh, the next year, um, 70, 71, I don't remember much about it. I think we probably finished 18th again in uh, in the second division. Um, and then we had the calamity of calamities. Uh, we had the absolute worst season. Um, we set a record points low for the second division in 71-72. Uh, so Ken Furphy had taken us up there. He left and went to help me someone. Was it Blackburn or Sheffield United? Mm -hmm. I can't remember which. Still yeah, and he uh, so he went, and we appointed someone called George Kirby, um, and we it was so bad that uh, only the only time we've lost a higher percentage of games was in the Premier League two seasons ago. It was that bad. It was nearly as bad as the Premier League season. Nearly. <laughs> um, and we plummeted down. And then the next season, we nearly uh, managed to get a double relegation. Um, and we stayed up. Um, I think that was the season Ross joined us, Ross Jenkins. Mm -hmm. um, and then we perked up a bit, as I remember, in 73, 74. 
Uh, I think that was the season that Billy Jennings scored 29 goals. Jeff's nodding. This is good. He's, mm-hmm. I, I don't have uh, access to all the facts right at my fingertips. Billy Jennings. Oh, we all love Billy Jennings. I think someone should chip in on Billy Jennings here. No, oh, he, he was a hero of mine, but um, I do write in the book about him uh, scoring a hat trick when I took my first serious girlfriend to the game. It was Tramir at home towards the end of the season and drove my, car, my dad's car for one of the first times ever. And I thought, you know, what could have gone better as a day? But uh, unfortunately, we were soon finished when I went off to, uh, to university. Um, well, she'd seen Billy Jennings. Of course, it would be over. Billy and her got married six months later. and <laughs> <laughs> Billy Jennings had a magnificent set of teeth. He did. He was, mm. he was very unlike most centre forwards. He he didn't like. He was he was unlike Barry Endine. He didn't go in head first where it hurt. No. He yeah. uh, he protected his teeth. He did, and, and his hairstyle. Yeah. <laughs> in those days, most centre forwards used to think teeth were just an affectation. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember. St- I was I was a ball boy that season, and I do remember standing behind the rookery goal in one game early on, and. Jennings had a header at goal and it went just wide and I put my hands up to catch it and my goodness me it stung my fingers and that was the moment at which I realised how hard professional footballers propel footballs it just seemed like it was going to be an easy catch it was a header and I couldn't hold it it yeah, was absolutely stinging. It, it would... but Bill Jennings was an extraordinarily good head. I mean, I think he was five foot nine inches tall, but he won a large proportion of his headers. He had a fantastic style where he jumped early and seemed to hang and scored a lot of headed goals. It, it was astonishing. The only similar thing I've ever seen is Mo Johnson. He could do the same thing and he mm. wasn't very tall, but he could beat big centre halves by the timing of his jump. It was incredible to watch. And uh, Hyder, I suppose. Hyder Helgeson, yeah. 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 Colin? Another thing with Billy Jennings is he was your archetypal 70s footballer. He looked the part. He, he could have gone out with sort of Rodney Marsh and Stan Bowles and he was that. He looked like that. He looked like if he ever weren't a footballer, he could have either been the sort of drummer in mud or he could have sort of gone on to star in the Confessions films because he had that the feather haircut and the yeah. cheeky... Sort of, he would have been Sid James' son in son in law in a sitcom. He looked that seventies <laughs> per Jack the Lad. He was he was he very much a seventies person. He was also a player who wore his shirt outside his shorts, and that was almost a sort of secret signal uh, in the nineteen seventies when uh, a lot of players were uptight. Defenders would always tuck their shirts in. Uh, but players like Rodney Marsh would always have their shirts hanging out. And Billy Jennings was one of those. And it just, I don't know, it was a signal that the player was a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit louche, maybe. <laughs> you talk about, like, is it, is it him, like, as an individual player? And I like, you know, Colin, you sort of say he, I think I know, the, I, I don't know off my heart, but, you know, the, the pictures, I think I know the exact player you're talking about. But the, the you know, the, the style of the 1970s, I suppose, Talk about some heroes already. For you, is there a player that sort of sums up the 1970s? Or, you know, maybe you're a hero, but just sums up that period for you, um, maybe in terms of style, um, in terms of footballing style, or maybe just for your your link with them? We're talking two dif- distinctly different periods. Yeah. Pre-1977 and post-1977. Yeah. And there's a different answer for each, I would say. I come in quite late. I, I didn't start going till the seventies. So Ross Jenkins would be all day long. He was like Roy of the Rovers in living form. He even looked like him. He was a uh, lanky goal scorer, and that the partnership he had with Luther was just amazing. But Ross Jenkins would be my seventies player, be, just for, for the fact when I joined the party. Yeah, yeah and that's absolutely right because he. Um... He mirrors the narrative of the 1970s. So the you know the narrative of the of the book uh, about the 70s, Bonser Out, is um, is the fall and rise of Watford Football Club across an, uh, an era. And Ross was signed in something like 1972, and he he was absolutely the whipping boy of the fans uh, for the first two or three years, and got it together a little bit. Um, in the Mike, later Mike Keane years, but it was an absolute transformation when Graham Taylor uh, arrived. In that player, 
everything else about the club. So Ross Jenkins' 1970s is an absolute mirror of the narrative of the club. I'm going to vote for Arthur Horsfield, <laughs> who, the last of the great goal hangers, really, had no speed whatsoever. Dobbin was his nickname. Ran around like a cart horse, I suppose. They signed him from, he'd been at Charlton, he'd been at Middlesbrough. Um, they signed him, I think, probably summer of 1975. And he was basically there for two years. And um, scored his share of tappings just from being in the right place at the right time. Was renowned for f- having um, taken the pitch whilst still cupping a smoking cigarette in his hand. By the end of his second season, had slowed down so much that he ended up playing at the at centre back, and, and was too slow to get upfield in time for them to take corners. <laughs> uh, he was shipped out by Graham in Graham's first week uh, on the basis of being one of the players who wouldn't move to live within 15 miles of Watford. Mm. Um, so I think he lived in Dartford, somewhere in Kent, and sure enough, he signed for Dartford, a non-league, of course, uh, and that was the last that that, that anyone saw of him. Um, then you, you look up his age at this time, he was 30. He was only 30 <laughs> and um, time, you know, he used to it? trundle around the pitch um, and, but was a bit of a favourite. Those two seasons, they, after they got relegated in 1975, which was horrible again, um, they had two seasons in the fourth division before Graham Taylor came along that I, for one, enjoyed enormously. They were just a brilliant laugh. Because we won a lot, or, or we didn't. I only that? went to the home games, um, and the home games were just great fun. And we won almost all of them. Away, that we were absolutely terrible. There was the famous defeat at Northwich Victoria in the cup, which is covered in the book. Um, but for those of us who only went to home games, it was it was it was a right good laugh, and you had this sense they were underachieving. There was quite a famous away win at Doncaster. Um, mm. in which Arthur Horsfield scored one of his tap-ins. Um, and David Harrison, who's uh, on the Treasury team but couldn't be with us for this discussion, uh, he was there and uh, he, he relates the story of the tap-in where, the, where Doncaster's goalkeeper uh, came out of his area to, to hoof away a long punt up field and completely missed it. Clearly couldn't recover quickly enough for Arthur Horsfield to just trundle on through uh, absolutely clear of everybody. And uh, I think in the Watford Observer next, the next week, he said how he'd had time to think to himself whether he should get down on his knees and just roll the ball over the line with his head to make it a headed goal. Um, and uh, David and his friend Big Ted, uh, I think, invaded the pitch in it, uh, at Watford winning away for once with a Arthur Horsfield tapping. But I remember... Arthur Horsfield and Ross Jenkins as being uh, a pairing that uh, was very exciting at Watford Graham School in the uh, in the early nineteen seventies. I used to write their names on the, on my exercise books, definitely. Arthur seemed to be like more like a you know if you look at him now maybe a cult hero. Yes. Mm, yeah. yeah. I, I well amongst uh, amongst a certain <laughs> yeah. audience, you got, you that got... would be Jeff and me. <laughs> <laughs> This, this is uh, all a bit of a joke. I thought he was absolutely useless. So, uh, <laughs> that's my take on that. But I would like to put forward two names just before uh, yeah. the 77 that um, caught my eye because I started off football as a defender. And they were um, Duncan Chopper Wellborn and um, Roger Studs Jocelyn because they were enforcers in the days when we weren't doing well, particularly in the league. But a lot of pleasure used to be gained from the terraces in those days by the sheer fierceness of the tackling that was allowed to go on, you know. And players literally go used to go through other players to get the ball. And it didn't matter who you clattered or what you clattered on the way, as long as you won the ball, the referee would say, say fair tackle, he's played the ball. <laughs> and watching those two at it was just a joy. If they were if they were hard, <laughs> tough men on the pitch. And, and therein watch. lies the difference between Richard and Jeff, is, is what I'm going to venture here. <laughs> but uh, he, he's, uh, he's romanticising the enforcers and the hard yes. men. Yeah. 
And Absolutely. Jeff is romanticising um, Arthur Horsfield. In fact, Jeff, <laughs> when Graham Taylor arrived, you wrote a letter to the Watford Observer, didn't you? Mm. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. <laughs> you were bemoaning how uh, this efficient way of winning matches uh, and uh, running up a record points total wasn't quite the fun that uh, things have been over the last two years with people like yes. Arthur Horsfield. Yes, I think beer had been taken that night. And what, do you remember the phrase that you used? You said that the days of wine and roses were over. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but I know what you meant, because there, there was a sort of patheticness about it that was utterly beguiling, because we were so good at home and so terrible away. And it was the lack of what Richard's talking about. It was the lack of uh, enforcer. And uh, there, there wasn't a spirit there that instantly Graham Taylor brought in that was was going to win games. Um, you can tell because the players were already there when Graham Taylor arrived um, and they had uh, already made many appearances for Watford and they went on to make even more uh, because they were very decent players and it just needed uh, a new broom around the place to turn it around. It was a particularly special broom, admittedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, uh, I might special... add that um, the week after that letter appeared, um, I was at home one evening, you know, the parents house and the phone rang and my mother answered it or our mother answered it and called me and said there's a mr taylor on the phone for you and it was graham and he'd read the letter in the watford observer and uh, had, had called up uh, to chat me through uh, how actually <laughs> it was all about progress and uh, <laughs> things were going to be good so that was my that was my exposure to his um, his uh, sort of you know community involving the the fans in what's going on approach, which uh, you know, is, is part of the, the the latter section of the book, of course. Amazing. Um, so we, we find ourselves at the that you know as, as Graham arrived. How different was it for you guys when he arrived? How I mean, Jeff not necessarily straight away accepting him, um, but Rich, if you how how much did it <laughs> How much for you did it change? Um, I think we're always a little bit uh, standoffish when a new manager comes in. So it was like two or three games after Graham arrived that um, I suddenly started thinking, hey, we have got something special here. Um, it, and the attitude on the pitch, you know, within three or four games from the start of the season. I, I can't remember. I think we might not have won every game when he first arrived, but um, you know, very quickly um, you could see a change in the attitude. Players that were well coached and, and knew what they were out there for, um, and it was just something we hadn't seen really for years and years, probably since the um, Ken Furphy days, and uh, it, it was marvelous. Um, and. Yeah, we were only in the fourth division, but um, for us, it was still wonderful to see us winning games and pushing up the league. And uh, very soon, you know, by mid-autumn, we were we were top of the league. And and I don't think we ever looked back. It's simple as that, really. Mm -hmm. With that, Richard, you know, the fact that you, know, you talk about Furphy and, and, and Graham, like to sort of, you know, two major managers, how different was was it, you know, in terms of what you saw in terms oh. of the the joy, the joy of what you saw on the pitch, oh. were they similar or just completely different? Quite different. Um, Ken Furphy was a, a wonderful organiser and um, built a team in 68, 69, um, which was a little bit different to the one he'd had in previous seasons where we'd been very high scorers, but let in a, quite a lot of goals and, and failed at the final hurdle uh, towards the end of the season. In 68, 69, he built a very workmanlike side with a very good defence, um, letting a record low number of goals uh, that season. I think it was only 34. And a, and a few of those were in the last three games when we'd taken off our, our foot off the pedal a little bit. So um, that his, his teams were efficient, but never got the great excitement um, other than the results um, from, you know, to get the crowd going. Graham Taylor was just different. I mean, it was just amazing. Um, I remember going to games and we had like four uh, strikers starting to fire regularly. Um, you know, you had Mays, Mercer, 
uh, Jenkins and um, Van Blisser, obviously, later on. Um, and some games you think, well, which of the two is he going to play up front? And I remember going to one or two games, and he just put them all on with the two, you know, um, two full backs pushing into midfield. So we were playing two, two, four, four, really. Um, and it was just phenomenal. It was so exciting. The football, the commitment to going forward, you know, we will score more goals than you. Um, I, uh, I, my, my sons came along later and were there for the second Graham Taylor coming. And I'm so glad they saw teams coached by him. For me, there's never been anything like it. Teams that were so on the front foot. And they invented high pressing long before Guardiola and Klopp because that's what Watford used to do. They used to try and win the ball back in the opposition half, catch them on the turn and, and you know, score goals that way. It, it, it was marvellous. You know, once I got into it and understood what he was doing, uh, we, we didn't win every game because we get some very good teams. Um, we did, in the fourth division, win <laughs> most weeks, to be fair. Uh, you got tougher the higher we went, but... but you know, you can tell my enthusiasm for his football in those days. I really loved it. And, uh, and those, yeah. that, that was where we noticed the difference, which was on the pitch. Um, but of course, the, the pivotal moment really um, was, uh, well, the title of the book is Bonser Out. Um, and bon Jim Bonser was the chairman who'd taken us up into Division 2 in 68-69. Um, and when Watford were relegated to Division 4 in 1974, 1975, uh, there were some very attractive badges that people wore in their lapels saying Bonser out. There were some very attractive silk scarves uh, with the phrase Bonser out. Um, we, we, <laughs> we don't see those these days with Potso out, do you? You see sort of homemade banners. But, uh, yeah, we should get some silk scarves printed. Well, maybe the silk scarves was a thing that um, maybe got him out in the end. And maybe that's what we're going wrong with, uh, or what for fans are going wrong with, with, with Gino. I mean, maybe it's <laughs> it all about the silk scarf. It could be that. Or um, then it was rather, back in those days, it was rather cheaper to buy a club yeah. and uh, we were so lucky as to who bought the club uh, from Jim Bonser so we should never forget that uh, but Elton John uh, a lifelong fan uh, someone who David Harrison remembers seeing driving to games in the 1970s um, he bought the club and he was the one who uh, appointed Graham Taylor in cahoots with other directors uh, but it was that change that was pivotal. So uh, right in the middle of the 1970s, uh, in this fall and rise, the turning point in the story really behind the scenes was that change of ownership um, and the change of ambition. Um, and uh, in 1977, uh, there was that famous painting that Terry Chalice did um, and was presented to Elton. Uh, on the, uh, get this right, I think it was the 14th of April 1977, home game against Darlington, last game of the season, when Keith Mercer was presented with the Player of the Season award. Lots of useless information there. <laughs> um, but that was Elton's dream. That was Elton's vision. Um, and that was before Graham Taylor arrived. And uh, that summer, he got a man in place and everything that Richard's talking about there is what we saw on the pitch as evidence of an absolutely instant change. And then we saw the rest of it. We saw a club being built uh, in the way that we didn't have a club before. And uh, one of the first things Graham Taylor did uh, was to say, right, we're not going to have a dog track anymore which is, I think, Colin, you really regret, don't you? I think you've got some kind of thing about the dog track. When, when I first started going, the dog track was one of the better things about the ground. It added a bit of glamour and a bit of sort of mystique to it because the ground was awful, let's be honest, around that time. But, yeah, I missed the dog track. I, I, I think it added something. You know, if they could have had a bit of speedway going around it as well, all the, more, all the better. I think that, that was a backward <laughs> step, the dog track. Going. It made it a challenge when when Jeff and I were ball boys. I certainly remember. I mean, I think I've recently seen um, someone on Twitter saying that what, these days Watford are a dog shit club. But when I was a ball boy, you actually had to avoid treading in it. 
<laughs> so, Colin, you turned up at that point. Um, yeah. You were hooked. Well, no, let's say you're, 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 you know, you were hooked at that point. So, for me, for you, um, tell me about the what it was like for you as a fan coming along because it was a, you know, the beginning of the family club. You know, we know the whole Wiccan family went along. It wasn't the family club at that time. Like no. I, I know when you when you were young, John, you you were very much a, a child of the family terrace. I, it, mm. This was akin to like at the time. You to put it in context, you know, the government had to put out adverts for kids not to play in electricity substations and swimming canals and play on building <laughs> sites. <laughs> Going to Watford was akin to that for me. It was the, like this. God knows what my parents were thinking. I was going on my own then. I was 13 and going on my own to this this place. There, there was this sort of air of, not danger, but excitement there. It, it was sort of, it was quite a rough old place. Not not necessarily because of hooliganism and that, but it, it was, mm. like you say, the dog track and that. It, it was very different to what it was in the 80s. And I, th- I think it hadn't become the family club to the eighties. It was still very much you. You had you went there and you were doing knees up, Mother Brown in a rookery, and after the game, charging through Charter Place, running around, having little rampages, and it, it was for me. It was so exciting, and I, I was hooked. And the fact that the football was good was part of it. But it was for, for a thirteen-year-old boy who was sort of. You know, Disneyland and Alton Towers hadn't been invented. Excitement then was was doing stuff that was slightly <laughs> naughty and slightly dangerous, and it, it was heaven. That was it. It was very different place. It was ramshackle. It was a lot. Of the ground was held together with paint and bitumen and oh, but the yeah. ground wasn't it marvelous? Wasn't it marvelous? There's so much about it, the ground. That, yeah, you know that. The, the walls um, that were around the ground that were topped with broken oh, glass yeah. uh, embedded in the top yeah. to stop people climbing over. But it didn't stop people at the big matches sitting on top. top. They're sitting on coats. They sat they? on yeah. top of the walls. Yeah. So presumably they brought thick coats to sit on to make the top of the wall nice and comfy. comfy. Yeah. There was graffiti at the back of the rookery as well. So, you know, these days you get uh, people sneakily put little stickers on the uh, urinals in yeah. the uh, away ends, which I think get pretty much cleared off after every game, after every visit by the away fans. Uh, but there was proper graffiti on, on the walls at football grounds. You know, not, not, not this arty stuff where people put their tags. It was people writing, I don't know, it's proper cockpit piss out. Kind of <laughs> Yeah, yeah. bombs around graffiti. Yeah, yeah Mike, um, Mike, went up to, Mike went up to uh, Rotherham the other day and he took a picture. He went to the old uh, Millmore and there was yeah, one, that that picture, was it one picture of the the glass in the on the top of the wall and it, mm. it flashed back, yeah. you know, again, I went in 86, mm. first year the the, 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 well, the, the Ralph stand was open at that point. Um, and but there was that the old character was still there, but that yeah, that was a mm. big flashback for me for what what life was. And, like. and another thing in the ground in the 1970s, and, and this wasn't just Watford, but the grounds everywhere. There were lots of vehicles mm. in football grounds. So there's uh, there's a picture in the book uh, from I think it's the Hull promotion game in 1979, where there's an ice cream van uh, <laughs> right next to the supporters' headquarters. Um, and, you know, you'd get T-vans at grounds. There would be disability cars all lined up by by uh, by corner flags at football grounds up and down the country. If you look at the footage of, of corners in the 1970s, there are always people sitting inside cars watching the corners being taken. Um, I mean, we didn't use the phrase to park the bus in those days, but it wouldn't be surprising <laughs> if there were buses actually in penalty areas. At some point in the 1970s. But they were what was called invalid cars, the three-wheeler blue ones. That... Yeah, disability cars. Disability. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you... so we're... Sorry, so and the crowd them. looked different as well. Yeah. The crowd was... There were no replica shirts for a start. Uh, there was no club clothing. Those kinds of things... Uh, shirts marked out that you were a player not that you were a fan completely different from today um so you know there was definitely no overweight middle-aged men in Watford badge training wear because that would have been laughable no it it was like the stewards is I I know it's a thing today is is a feature of the stewards and like these armies of people walking up and down steps for no reason back then it was half a dozen blokes that had rolled out the supporters club grabbing sort of a 
a grotty high vis on the way out and you'd have a few policemen and sort of a motorcycle parked in the corner of the rookery. There'd always be a man with a white hat motorcycle helmet policeman. Mm. And it, it was totally different, but it, it was fantastic times, you know, and, and you think back now and you think just, you realize it and it takes you think back and think, yeah, you have to, God, football's changed. But then you think, of course it has going back that 50 years now, if back then, it would have been sort of four up four old men talking about the 1920s sort of the equivalent to what it is today it's yeah yeah it, it was it, it was very different because it was a bloody long time ago yeah it was. there's a certain seriousness about the about uh about today that there wasn't yeah. in the 1970s oh god the yeah. sort of carefree element to it and i was just thinking there's a there's a picture in the book i think it's of our first goal in uh, the second division when we were up uh, in 1969 70. Um, and the goalkeeper's picking up the ball out of the net after Keith Eddy has scored it. Um, and there's a ball boy in the foreground jumping up and down on the pitch. And and that's what happened. I, I, if you've seen the footage of Barry Endin scoring the goal uh, against Liverpool in 1970, the ball boys are absolutely leaping around for joy with absolute carefree abandon. Um, and these days, the ball boys, I don't know, they look as surly as stewards, don't they? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a tiny there, bit. there was an attitude of boys will be boys at matches, so they were given a certain amount of leeway, as Colin was saying. But talking about the Chelsea game uh, in the semi-final in 1970, it was the only time I can remember being at a match that was so crowded that boys were pushed down by hand over the heads of the supporters down to the front so that they could see the game when when they uh, come in at the back. And, um, you know, that sums up the sort of health and safety in those days. Um, it would literally be um, pushed down so they could they could see. It was uh, quite different. So hey. much of it's different. And, and, and so many pictures that we've got in the book, there are the piles of hay around the pitch, you know, and, and no cows eating it at all. I don't know. I don't know what the hay was for. But uh, it's it just, it was such a different time. And you, I look back at those and uh, it's, I, I find it wonderful, absolutely wonderful. It didn't seem wonderful at the time, a lot of it. But uh, you look back now and you see how different it is. And uh, football seems a completely different game. Yeah, but it wasn't wonderful at West Ham in 1978 when we played them in the third round of the Cup. And the Watford fans were encouraged to stand on the South Bank and were attacked full on by uh, West Ham fans. And there were a lot of women and children amongst the Watford crowd. And that was the start of thinking, this is not right. Something really is going to have to change with this game. Because it wasn't fair. Watford were a fourth division side. West Ham were a first division side. You know, it should have been a friendly game. We actually gave them a very good game and only lost 1-0. But um, I just thought, this is scary. This, this is really going to have to change. And soon after that, I think the, the early you know, segregation uh, plans were put in place so that it would keep fans apart. But it took, mm. still took a few more years to do it properly. So, Jeff, you know, everyone sort of is, you know, looking back <clears throat> on these things, as it, the whole book is about. The, the, particularly, though, when you look back, you, you know, from where we are now, do you look back in a way of thinking, like Ollie's quite, you know, sort of reminiscing there and how it was, how good it was, um, but not quite say it was better, what 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 do you look back? Do you is there anything you would like to bring and uh, bring back to the to the now? I want a terrible tannoy where it's so rubbish that they can't play music to try and build up the atmosphere before games, or music that's intended to console you after the final whistle. I want to stand in the rain. I don't want to sit in a lovely seat. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, what, do you, what would you like to bring back? Well, the the, the tea hut. The only place in the ground where there was any catering at all, apart from ice cream vans at particularly big games. I did have a friend who once ate five Mars bars at the same game that he bought from the tea hut. He might even be listening to this podcast now. <laughs> yeah, it's still like 50 quid to do that get five Mars bars, isn't it, now? A more serious point I would make is, is that um, I would bring back pay at the turnstile because, well, you can do that now yeah. with, the, you know, with your Apple Pay, we can all pay instantly as we go through the turnstile. And in those days, being able just to turn up 
to a match, make a late decision to go, make a late decision not to go. Um, you didn't have you could walk around the ground and stand in different places and get different views of the game, um, or get hear different things being said by different people. You get different experiences of the game within the game by moving around. Um, and I just I think if you could just have that pay on the day turn up, it would give it more spontaneity. I think we would all feel less entitled uh, because we haven't paid in advance for perhaps a season or or paid in advance to a game and thinking we need to get our money's worth and that kind of thing. Um, I, th I think that the way that football has evolved has changed our attitudes towards it. Um, and this may be rose-tinted glasses and I'm sounding a bit ridiculously nostalgic about it all. Uh, but, but a little thing like that, I think, could make a big difference to the way that people perceive football and it's eminently doable mm. there's could... this phrase now that football is the the most important of the least important things um it wasn't then it it really probably it really didn't seem to matter very much um and you know, when your team is losing you're not reminded of it the whole time Mm. through Ooh. your consumption of media or social media or especially if you're in the premier league where oh, you're yeah. just reminded of it every single day um i'd i'd also I mean, one of the things that, that um, colin uncovered for the book was a set of photographs from a ground called the shea which uh, was halifax's home ground I, it still is i think they still play in the same place it doesn't look anything like that now but there's this set of photographs from from i think the second last game of 1977-78 when Watford played at Halifax they were taken by Halifax's club photographer and we've had access to those and they are just the most glorious encapsulation of lower league football in the 70s the both what's going on on the pitch with sort of ruckuses and players lying on the floor and other players gesticulating at them. Um, but uh, equally to, to, to pictures of the crowd. There's one picture of the crowd. Um, in in front, you've got a, a goal mouth scene where Luther appears to be kicking Halifax's goalkeeper up the arse uh, into the air, <laughs> launching him into space. And behind that, if you look at the crowd, there are three people. Absolutely fabulous <laughs> photograph. Uh, and there's, there's others in that sequence where um, there's just people dotted around on a grass bank, you know, which is apparent, you know, that's what Watford's ground used to look like in the 50s. Halifax's still looked like that in the 1970s. Um, and, you know, we've made a, a four page feature out of that. And it's possibly my favourite four pages in the whole book. <laughs> I think the point that Jeff makes there is really important, which is that there just wasn't so much media at the time. And that uh, that really did impact, when I look back and, and compare it to now, it really did impact how we consumed football, that lack of media. I mean, I think each game felt fresher when you watched it because you hadn't been made to think about it all week by wall-to-wall -wall media coverage. Uh, there was certainly more respect for the jobs that the players and managers did uh, because there weren't people giving their opinions on how those jobs should be done all the time. So we just thought, well, these are the guys that are doing the job. Let's, let's let them get on with it. Um, and seeing Watford in the national media was, was rare and really special. Um, and to a degree, I think people still like it when we're on Sky or something like that. Um, but it was really unusual. I mean, games were not filmed largely in the 1970s. So where they were, it was very exciting. And now looking back on it, um, it's it's really different. And you only saw things once at a game. You'd go to a game and you'd see it once. So it was really hard to work out <laughs> who was at fault or uh, where the key moment had been in the build-up because you were just watching it and then the goal went in and you celebrated. But you couldn't analyse it there and then. And there was no chance to analyse it um, after the game either. So you relied on the, the match reports, notably the Watford Observer and the, the, the pictures. And so those became extra special to us because we didn't have other media. And now looking back, 
uh, I realized how special they were because so many of the pictures that, that we've used and that when I look through programs from the 1970s, I remember them all. These photos, have, I've absorbed them. And, and because they were so rare, I, I, I couldn't do the same now because there's so much imagery surrounding the game, so much photography of the clubs and videos of the club. But I remember pretty much every photo from Watford's programme, I've realised, from flicking through a, a season's worth. Um, and they were just really special. I remember headlines from the Watford Observer. Um, they just stuck in their mind because there was so little media. And I think that is what makes it special. It was the scarcity of it, the rarity of it um, when we were being covered in media, but covered in the media. Um, that just utterly transforms uh, the way that we consume football now because there's just so much of it. Richard, I think you'd like to, you'd like to bring back... Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, if you actually want to relive that atmosphere, you can now. You can turn up and pay on the day. You can stand on a terrace and meet up with your mates without worrying that you're going to be in a seat 50 yards away from them. And that's at lower league football and at non-league football, which I go to quite a bit of now just to get that atmosphere back. You know, your Bromleys and your Boreham Woods and uh, St Albans's and, uh, and so on and so on. Um, I love it. And, and you do get that atmosphere now, so it's not gone. The problem is that football at the higher level has now been taken over by rich men who are doing it for their own promotion and ego. And uh, it has become an extremely serious business. And, you know, we're all paying the price of that, which is we have to sit, you know, in ordered rows. We have to order our tickets in advance, no admission on the day and so on and so forth, all these rules. And that for Watford, you know, in my viewing, as uh, all you were saying, it's, it's, it's spoiled my enjoyment uh, to a large degree now, you know. So Colin. that's my, my view. But it's still there. Yeah. You can still find it in lower league football. And you can see three men alone standing on the terrace sometimes. <laughs> and it's, it's, it gladdens the heart. And you can find a tea hut. It's it's one I do recommend it just to <laughs> fulfil your soul again from the hype and the thrust and the social media nonsense we have to put up with at the scene, uh, higher levels of the game now. Yeah. Colin, um, um, it, it struck me when Richard was saying about sort of rich men owners with egos and that that around 1975 there would have been sort of four old codgers sitting round who watched their games at Casio Roads saying the very same thing about Elton John and yeah. stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's a different time. I look at it and, and echo in knowledge words about the media and things as well, but it wasn't as precious. It seems to be you go to the football now, like I've been at Vicarage Road and I've been given an award and then told, you know, like don't step over that white line because you'll be on the playing surface sort of and, and things like that. And, and back back then, it wasn't like that. There's a story in the book that um, Simon wrote, Simon Cheatham, about after the game, just strolling round and willy-nilly, willy perhaps being a bad pun, but strolling into the visitors' dressing room after a game and you could move around the stadium and there wasn't that that almost preciousness that you, you can come to the ground, but there's so many rules, there's so many regulations. It's almost like it's a favour and you're privileged. But... It should be up to us if it's a privilege or not. And I think I do feel privileged that I see them in the 70s. But at the same time, I wasn't made to feel it was a privilege. Well, st stand on the pitch in uh, the old days and you'd have got Les Simmons' pitchfork up your yeah. ass. So I don't think <laughs> you were quite allowed to walk across it then, if I'm perfectly honest. I don't know. They're, they're, I've seen people strolling on the pitch at the end, just cutting across to get out, sort of in some games. <laughs> yeah, it's a um, totally different world and... Yeah, was. we yeah. can pine for it. Whether we'd want to go back to it in truth, I don't know. But th they were certainly really good days, my favourites. Were they the days of wine and roses, do you think? <laughs> uh, they were the Newcastle Brown and sort of quality street more than roses back then. But yes. <laughs> yeah. So I think also one, oh. one, sorry, one of the aspects is um, I think people don't feel as close to the players no. as they'd like to quote David Harrison again, he he, uh, he says not only did he used to see Elton John driving to the ground uh, in the 1970s, but he used to see Dave Butler, who was a, a right back 
uh, for Watford in the early 1970s and became a physiotherapist, uh, used to see him walking his dog in Bushy. And David says that if you wanted to, if you ever wanted to speak to Graham Taylor's captain, you could just pop down to William Hill. <laughs> yeah. A different time. Could you tell me a little bit more about Bonza? How is he seen as a just being frugal, or what, 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 how is how is he viewed by fans? Richard, how did you how did you see him? Or did, or did you did you really feel the owner at at, at, the, at that time? Yes, no. He, he was obviously um, always being referred to in the press, the local press. By the way, as well as the weekly Watford Observer, we also had the Evening Echo, which uh, was six evenings a week that uh, covered Watford. And unfortunately, our friends up the M1 equally, because it was printed in Hemel and covered both areas. But um, yeah, Bonza was um, uh, obviously respected in the earlier days. I think he'd done some good work in the 60s and brought uh, the team through. But towards the end, um, the lack of investment, he was only a, a local businessman and he couldn't afford even then by those standards to to fund the club with enough money along with his directors to uh, do what Watford needed to do in terms of shifting its um, purpose and moving up the league. And, you know, people started getting fed up even in, in those days. Expectations weren't high at Watford, but when we were heading down towards the lower reaches of the fourth division, enough was enough because even historically we'd generally done better than that and uh, had been knocking on the second division for a long time before we got there. So, um, yeah, I would say uh, it, it was a gradually um, you know, downward spiral. Um, there was some other guy came in at one point to try and uh, get the... Leslie Wise. Leslie Wise, that was it. Um, there was a big um, hoo-ha about him being rejected by Bonza. I think it turned out that he didn't really have the means to... Um, support his claims to be a wealthy man and and help the board but uh it was not long after that before Elton John came along anyway so um well Bonser treated him very cautiously at first Elton was as good as his word and boy he knew football you know he could he could mix it with anybody uh even the professionals in the conversation about the game he knew it inside out um and uh soon proved his worth so I, I yeah. think just as all um, all fo- just as all political careers end in failure, mm. all football chairmanships end in failure. Yeah. Um, mm. So I would argue, I think that Bonser was pretty successful for twelve years, and he took over the club in nineteen fifty eight, um, just after they'd been allocated into the new fourth division. His big move. Uh, right at the beginning was to sign Cliff Holton. You know, really well, they went out on a limb to do that and it took a couple of years before it worked out. But that gave them the momentum, put them in the third division and things improved pretty much throughout the 60s, reached this absolute high point at the start of the 70s. That's when he should have declared victory and moved on if he wanted to be remembered as this great chairman, but he hung on for another six years, by which time they'd been relegated twice and were back in the fourth division again. He was apparently a bit of a difficult individual. He didn't. He wasn't a man of great bonhomie, I think. His reputation amongst those of us who started going sort of late in the early 70s uh, is, is, has rather been tainted by that, I think. I think overall you'd say that two-thirds of his... Uh, rain uh, was, was was very successful, but yeah, the last third of it not so much. I think it's also important to remember, as, as we think about it, just how ownership of football clubs has changed. Um, so, as Richard said, there, you know, he was a local businessman, and uh, that was how football clubs were run. And football clubs were very small businesses, um, and continued that way really until the TV money came in in uh, thirty years ago. You know, Watford had very few staff, for example, because it was just a small business. Ron Rollett's job uh, in the 1970s is now probably done by, I don't know, how many dozens of people. Mm-hmm. Um, there was pretty much one groundsman with a few helpers, perhaps, uh, on match days. And it was it was just a different time. The, the, the way of putting money into the club was very different. Financial 
tricks weren't being played. And in a way, Elton was really one of the very early, one, one of the new breed, really, of, of people who bought who brought big amounts of money because it cost us, did it cost us a million to get up to the top division? I think it did. And that was an extraordinary amount of money. Mm -hmm. And other clubs reviled us because, you know, we were money bags Watford uh, because we had Elton John running the club. And and it was true. We had more money. We spent £175,000 on Steve Sims in in the third tier, which was an extraordinary amount of money. Back in the day with Bonser, it was it was a local businessman running a very small concern on the side. Um, and so fans' expectations uh, weren't really about uh, the money necessarily. You wanted to see a successful team. And it was when things weren't going well that you would complain. So as Jeff says, that Jim Bonser had many, many good years. Uh, but when we started declining from our height, and you can all think of the same parallels these days, when we started declining from the height of the second division and found ourselves back down in the fourth division, who do you start moaning to? Who do you start complaining about? Well, that'll be Jim Bonser, and we'll get the silk scarves out and the little lapel badges going. <laughs> But we can find out more about it and read more about it and see more about it in the new book. Uh, where is it available if I want to gr- grab, grab myself a copy of? Right, it's available. You can get it from direct from our website, which is the com. quite nice and simple, and then just follow the links from there. Or from the Hornet Shop, it'll be on sale from the Coventry game onwards. From the Hornet Shop, price £15. From the Rookery End, a podcast about life following Watford FC. As Colin said, you can get a copy of the book Bonds Are Out by going to the Hornet Shop if you're at the Vicarage Road in the next couple of weeks uh, or you can go to thewatfordtreasury.co.uk. Grab yourself a copy and enjoy it during the international break uh, where we'll have a, a bit of free time, a bit of free headspace from everything that is going on at Watford. Thank you so much for listening, but a massive thank you to Jeff, to Ollie, to Colin and to Richard for giving up their time to spend a, a bit of time with us, I suppose, to learn about the book and learn a bit about what uh, they thought and that, what they saw about as a, as a Watford fan, what life was like in the 1970s. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, and we'll be back with the podcast after Watford's trip to St Andrews on the weekend. Come on, you all.